Do you want to hold him? Davey, come on. Come here, Davey. Did we reach your comfort zone? Yeah. <laughs> Are you good? You calm down? Since humans invented the vehicle, we have had a passion for going off-road, adventuring, and exploring. Since then, people have been trying to perfect and build the best off-road vehicles possible. And you know what? We did it. And you know what it's not? It is not a Nissan. It's not a Toyota. It's not your precious JL. It's the 2004 to 2006 Jeep LJ. If you're gonna build your dream Jeep, what platform would you start with? Uh, LJ. LJ. LJ, obviously. LJ. LJ Tracer, of course. Probably an LJ. The TJ platform comes out in 1997, and people love its comfort ride of the four corner coil suspension, the off-road ability of the straight axle. By 2003, we have the Rubicon TJ platform. Toyota at the time, you know, we've got pickup trucks. Nissan has the non Pathfinder, Pathfinder. Dakotas uh, from Dodge were pretty cool, but realistically at that time frame, they were trying to go fast and start their, you know, introduction to muscle car nature that they eventually produce with some of the, the other Dodge and Mopar products. And Ford, they're pretty underwhelming. The Ranger, while reasonably being indestructible as a pickup truck, really isn't a great off-road vehicle. So the market as a whole isn't really pursuing off-road ability. However, by 2004, the Jeep TJ Unlimited dubbed the LJ by enthusiasts or the long Jeep is produced. Overall, it's 15 inches longer than a standard TJ Wrangler, but it has about 10 additional inches on the wheelbase. So they increased the wheelbase from a poultry 93 and a half or 93.4 to 103.4 on the LJ, giving us 10 inches additional on the wheelbase, 15 inches on the body, that means more room for groceries and a little bit extra leg room for the kids in the back seat. Now, what makes the LJ so prominent is the fact that it actually was the same width, it interchanged with all the same parts, and overall, it didn't take a whole lot more for them to be built in a really big capacity than what was already being done in the off-road market at that time. That longer wheelbase gives you significant stability when you are approaching an ascent or a descent. That allows you to feel more confident as you're looking over a cliffside or you know if you're straight up and down. Now, the beauty of this at 103 inches, it's not that much bigger wheelbase so you still have pretty good turn radius on the trails those of you who are driving those big school buses those minivans on the trails your jk's your jl's and your jt's will understand that sometimes you got to do a multi-point turn when your smaller wheelbase rigs are able to kind of zigzag through the trees more confidently or capably the tj was so prolific because it kind of perfected that smaller wheelbase narrower platform up to this point, the LJ took it the next step forward and gave it that really confidence-inspiring longer wheelbase and overall more room for groceries and gear. The engineers were very much aware of our industry's propensity to modify vehicles. So there's a little bit of insider information that as I've become friends with a number of the individuals who actually helped design this vehicle in the first place, they said that they wanted to push the limits with off-road capability, but then also lay the groundwork of the foundation that would allow us as enthusiasts to be able to do these really wild and quality modifications that we are so apt to do. So at that point in time, within reason, they gave us some of the best options available in a production vehicle. The LJ came stock, no questions asked, with a Dana 44 rear end 
and a Dana 30 front axle. 373 gears at a minimum. That gear ratio was greater than the 307 gears that most other TJs were coming with at that time. Additionally, you could still get a TJ Wrangler with a Dana 35 rear end. So the LJs at their base model were already a step above what else was being produced. And like I said, don't get me started on the Nissans and the Toyotas and the S10s and the Ford Rangers of that time. I know, I see you Bronco owners, Ford wasn't even relevant at that point. The TJ Unlimited, the LJ's legacy, was solidified long before it was ever produced. And thanks to those forefathers of our industry who took all of the things they had learned from the previous 50, 60 years of production prior to the LJ being drawn up on the sketchboard and figured out as a production vehicle that it eventually became. This particular platform will live on as one of the greatest off-road production vehicles ever produced. Now, ultimately, there was only roughly 45,000 of these Jeeps ever made. Rust, collision, and obviously gross ownership negligence has taken a, a large handful of these off the road. But there are dedicated communities of enthusiasts who are actively buying and building this platform today. I love the new technology that the JK and the JL and the JT have affected the Jeep market. And honestly, Bronco owners and Dodge owners, eh, Ford guys, there's actually some decent off-road vehicles built today. And in fact, we get all the creature comforts and a really pleasant off-road experience out of our newest produced vehicles. But history will prove that this particular platform, the less than 45,000 Jeeps ever made that adorn this badge and this design, will arguably go down in history as some of the best production vehicles ever. If you're one of the lucky individuals who owns one of these or has owned one, we'd love to hear from you. If you're an enthusiast who's on the lookout and you just think they're really cool, then say something below as well. Or if you completely disagree with me and you think that your early 2000s Nissan Pathfinder is the greatest gift to off-roading, I wanna hear from you as well. But realistically, I hope that I've presented enough argument to convince you that the 2004 to 2006 Jeep Unlimited Wrangler or LJ is the greatest off-road vehicle ever produced. We're gonna put a Hemi in my truck. Why? Because you should always put a Hemi in a truck. Stuck on a zip tie tail. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh. A lot of people are always asking, like, what's it take to V8 swap my Jeep? Uh, and we're particularly talking about Jeeps that didn't originally come with a V8 option. So your Wrangler platforms before the JL Hemi, that kind of scenario. The easiest way to think about an engine swap is no matter what motor you put in it, there's always going to be a certain amount of things that you're going to touch. So obviously the cooling system is going to be different or change because you're putting more demand on it than your original engine. Your motor mounts are going to change. Often your bell housing will change. And most of the time your transmission is not going to be up to the task of the horsepower and torque that the V8 has. So Lots of times a motor swap automatically becomes a transmission swap at all as well. But obviously that's a case by case specific question and problem. So then you have the next challenge of fuel system and how you're going to make this motor work in the Jeep. Now again, that depends on the model, the era of motor you're putting in. Now specifically we're talking about uh, Hemi and LS's in this talk. So we're both computer controlled on both engines. Now, one challenge you have is Chevy 
being the LS is obviously going to be a completely different software and talk than the Mopar Hemi is. So you do have an advantage of a Hemi over an LS in that situation where it's at least the same computer language, that kind of stuff. You have a higher success rate having a Hemi talk to your original gauges, having full functionality of the vehicle once you're all done. Now, with that said, there is kits to allow your LS to plug into, say, a JK and have those functions work as well. But it's just, again, an extra layer that you must do. Another advantage of the, the Hemi is, first off, you can say, I have a Hemi and they look cool. Um, but one caveat of that is, is the valve covers are physically larger because of the Hemi design. So sometimes you have a package fitting in the engine bay problem where the LS is a pretty compact motor. It fits in a lot tighter of a package. If you're doing an older Jeep, like a CJ, obviously you're gonna have less issues there because now you can add whatever you would like uh, electronics wise and you can kind of do more of a standalone system and then at that point it really doesn't matter you could literally put uh, gm ford chrysler heck you could put toyota in there if you wanted to it wouldn't matter you just kind of have to choose what fits your needs best in this instance we are playing around with a 5.7 hemi so this was originally in a jeep grand cherokee something for this owner that was specifically something that was important to him as he wanted it to be a jeep engine in a jeep and we have that because it is a jeep grand cherokee hemi and a tj and what we're doing with this one is we're basically just doing some maintenance uh, some gaskets that needs addressed just checking it over for health make sure everything's good it really doesn't mean that there's a problem with it or any of that kind of stuff that's another thing important to note is whenever you do one of these swaps you still have maintenance you still have consumables things that can and will fail that you need to kind of plan as part of your build can i get to the water pump can i get the serpentine belt off can i get to the spark plugs that kind of stuff because you're going to have to maintain this if you're going to use it that is one unique thing with a jeep over say a hot rod so most people put a hot rod together and they never intend to work on that again it's kind of just a showpiece we go out and we wheel and beat on our jeeps and really expect a high level of functionality and daily driverness of it and on all intents and purposes this Hemi uh, Swap TJ has all that. A lot of people don't know uh, why, why would you do a V8 swap? Well, there's a multitude of reasons for that. If you got really large tires, now you're just not quite up the snuff of, of having the horsepower to turn those. You have to look at the kind of a cause and effect and what does it take to make more horsepower? Now we can upgrade the original engine or sometimes you are actually money ahead just doing a V8 swap because it inherently, as the design of the motor, can make more power and more torque. Uh, the whole adage of no replacement for displacement kind of scenario. That is some truth to that. Right there is really a big reason to think about one of these swaps. Obviously, you're not going to be doing this to get better mileage because uh, it's just no, <laughs> not going to be a thing. But we don't build our Jeeps for that anyway. Another nice side effect is nothing sounds quite like uh, a very nice V8 exhaust wise. They just have a nice sound. No replacement for that as well. Torque is really hard to quantify too with a Jeep. It's one of those situations, unless you felt it, you really can't explain why that makes so much difference. Horsepower sounds cool, but it's really the torque that we're wanting for a Jeep. That's what helps move those tires, helps propel the Jeep down the road. And there's an old saying of horsepower is how fast you reach the wall. Torque is how much wall you take with you as you punch through it. And really for a truck, 
Jeep scenario, that is what's most important for us, is that feeling of strength as you're giving it the gas, that kind of scenario. In a smaller motor, like a four cylinder or a V6, or even a straight six, you're going to have less of that. Now, with that said, they're not bad by any stretch, but as we modify the vehicles, you get to a tipping point where a motor swap may make more and more sense. So follow along with us here. We're gonna be taking this to a very high quality engine uh, machine shop. They have agreed to help us going into this motor. Uh, I've worked with this technician for a long time. He's actually who built the flathead in my 36. He built uh, a couple AMC 360s for us for various projects. He really knows his engines. He's an avid drag racer, knows how to get the horsepower out of them. So we don't take things out of the shop often to other places, but when we do, we really try to search for uh, true experts in their field. And that's really what Steve is. All right, motor is dropped off and we're gonna hear back from them in a couple weeks and see where we go from there. So one of our, our infamous stories, so when we were buying whole Jeeps and parting them down for, you know, their best, most useful parts, uh, it responded to an ad, I think Scott had found it and Scott and I, you know, were pretty jazzed up because it was a pretty unique Jeep XJ Cherokee. And it was a four cylinder, a five speed, which is kind of a rare, com two door, rare combination. So we're like, yes, we want to buy this guy said it's for parts. And uh, we showed up at his house. You could immediately tell that he had like kind of like a compound living situation. There was fences and there was, he was pretty guarded in his approach. You know, we started to look at the Jeep and we popped the hatch open and the back was like full of like hay and dirt and Oh, we didn't really care because we were buying it for parts, but started to talk to this guy and he had, he had livestock on the compound. Why did he feel comfortable enough to divulge to us two rando strangers who have just showed up to buy his Jeep for parts, but he divulges to us he was smuggling Russian goats in the back of this Jeep. And I, I go a step further and he was actually talking about like bringing extra insemination tools. It was super weird, but the gist of it was we authentically bought a parts Jeep that was used in illegal Russian goat smuggling. And that's a true story. So when my sister called and said she needed help taking her goats and shoving it in the back of uh, her and her husband's XJ Cherokee, I couldn't have been any more jazzed up. It was not even a question in my mind that I had to participate so that I could honor the Russian goat smuggler. She gunned it at you. She gunned it at you. All right, so this is Cosmo. Come on. Come on. I know you want a new one. You need one. He's not going to like rear up at you, is he? Ouch, ouch. Okay, go for it. Okay. Now you can do it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, Uncle Neil. Oh, boy. Okay. I'm going to get, I'm going to get right in the, in the cool yunes. All right. Pick, Woo! Oh. Woo! <laughs> this one back here. Just, can we go? I've got his butt. We just need to slide. We just need those kids to keep moving. <laughs> He's nervous tooting. Okay, I'm stuck. Two, three.
<laughs> okay, okay. It's okay. That's good. Oh, good boy. Yeah, be careful. Okay. Ooh, that was. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good boy, Cosmo. Okay. You gotta move. Everybody, step back. Ooh. Bethy, you got a hold of him? No, oh. I don't. Okay. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I need a, there we go, that's okay. Good. Oh. Okay, do it again. Success. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we started the day with uh, goat wrestling into the back of Jeeps. And we gotta go do podcasts. And then we gotta watch uh, the, the eclipse.